Thanks for the thanks for the invite and the opportunity. My name is Janko Bajotavela, and today we're going to speak about transition from engineering to product management. Um, the agenda today is we'll talk a, a little bit about my own transition. Then I would like to share with you some lessons that I've learned uh, in my experience from moving from engineering to product management, share some mistakes that I have made, and hopefully to help you uh, deal with future similar situation better than, than I did. Um, then uh, we'll talk a little bit about how can you improve your product management skills coming from engineering background. And of course, at the end, I would love to, to get some questions from you. So about my transition. Uh, until I started preparing this presentation, I didn't realize that I was actually in product much before than I thought. So this is my this is not the actual picture, uh, but it's something very close to this. This is my first product that I built when I was 10. It's a homemade portable uh, pinball machine. So um, it really addressed user problems. We, as kids, we wanted to play pinball a lot. We, we couldn't spend all our money on it, but also we wanted to use it for our own convenience. So I went ahead, got a board, and I built this, these little machines. It made few users happy. Uh, but I don't know what happened afterwards. I didn't know how to scale it. Maybe I didn't have uh, investment in seed funding, so I just dropped it there. So uh, I went to school in the St. Cyril and Metodius University in Skopje. That's in Macedonia. That's where I'm from, and that's where I was uh, born and raised. I graduated in 2005 with a degree of computer science. And then right after, I started working at Sivus, which is an um, international software consultancy and development company. They build their own products as well. And that's where actually my engineering career started. So I came fresh out of college. I thought I knew a lot. Um, I was lucky to get into a very great team of engineers. And those guys were just amazing. And then I realized then that there is a, so much learning that I need to have in order to be even close to what they are. Um, they were very helpful, they were very smart, and they helped me grow within my own role, but also grew within, within the company. So at Sivus, I had a various engineering roles. I started as a junior engineer, then as an engineer, then as a tech lead. Uh, at one point, I was head of engineering for our product division. Uh, I was also at one point, we had a branch office R&D in Belarus, so I was head of that office as well. And that's where my, actually my transition happened into product management. So Sivus uh, uh, was partner with Thomson Reuters. Uh, you might have heard it's a big financial and news, news company. And then um, they needed, we had some developers working there, and they also needed someone to substitute for a product manager. So they recommended me, and um, the role sounded interesting. And I remember everything went so quick. It was maybe Monday. I was in Belarus working there, leading the office. I got an interview on Tuesday. They said, they want you right away. On Friday, I went back home in Macedonia to repack. Sunday, I was in New York. Monday, it was my first day as a product manager. Uh, it was a little bumpy, and I will speak more about it later. And then this was a temporary engagement. Then I moved to an uh, education technology company called Amplify. I uh, had a various product management roles. Over there, we were focusing on helping uh, kids, mainly K-3, to to learn better. It was based a lot on data. And now, for the past year and change, I'm at Olapic, which is a visual, visual marketing company. So through our platform and services, we help global brands discover, enrich, and then activate visual content in the channels throughout the whole, whole user journey. So as I mentioned before, my transition uh, was bumpy. When I started being a product manager, I realized even though I was a senior professional, there were a lot of skills that actually I did not have and much more junior people than me had. And then um, I, I, I realized that I'll have to invest a lot 
into, into building them. They could speak better with customers that could present better. They could communicate better. So um, if you're going through this currently or some of you have went and it, and, it, and it was bumpy for you as well, I think that's okay. It's not really a natural transition. And some of us come from engineering to product management. Some come from design, business analysis, um, sales, marketing, and so forth. And um, though we know very well as engineers how to build products, uh, knowing that uh, is just one, 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 uh, one skill from all the skills you need to possess to be successful in your job. So um, I would encourage if you want to do the transition to try first within your own company. And that often it's easier. So try to look for opportunities within your company, share your intents with your manager. Most of your manager will support you because you will still be doing something in service in your old company. And what is very important is your colleagues know you. So they know you're competent, they know they can trust you, and they will be more willing to give you the chance uh, to move into the role rather than applying as an engineer to a completely different place as a product manager. And then this is you know, connected to what I mentioned about the skills. Don't be concerned about taking more junior role than the role that you currently have in engineering. There is a quite a lot that you need to learn to, um, to be a great product manager. Um, me, um, I was at one point head of engineering and then my first product manager uh, role was much, much roller, uh, lower in seniority than what I had, but um, I really was interested in product management. I still love doing it. So throughout years, you know, you can get to the point you want to be. So I would like to share some lessons that I've learned having product management in engineering head. Um, one of the first things I thought of was there's, there can be simple solution to important problems. As engineers, we sometimes tend and want to use cool technology to solve the problems. Uh, after all, we are engineers, right? But as the product managers, what is important is what, it, what is the problem that you are solving? How you're solving the problem doesn't, doesn't really matter uh, that much. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in my a few years, few years back, at Amplify, we we realized that um, basically we had a product which was assessments, observation assessments for kids, and it, which was proving to be very efficient. But um, if the teachers would not take this assessment that regularly, then the difference of the student outcomes was huge. So we we wanted to see like how can we sort of make some of these teachers in certain districts to take the assessments more regularly than others. We at the beginning thought of a super fancy algorithms technology and whatnot. And, but then later, we actually, what we decided was to send them a text message at the right time and just to say, hey, go, you have students that you need to assess, go do that, that was it. All the teachers care deeply about their students, but they're super busy. They have no time, so they have no uh, time to think about all these things. Um, I remember we built a solution that was super, super quick. There were had so many manual steps. I, I went to a couple of conferences for teachers. I was writing down their mobile phone numbers in a spreadsheet. We ran the experiment a few times. We got an um, improvement on over 200%. So, uh, it doesn't matter if you use cool technology or not, what matters is the problem that you are solving. Uh, I think that even though details are important, uh, focusing on detail is more critical for engineering. In product management, what is more important is to focus on the lo long-term goals, on the roadmap, on the big picture, and uh, remember that the time that you are spending focusing on Details is time that you don't uh, spend on focusing on the long-term goals and all the other important things. 
don't focus too much on details and um, miss the big picture, right? I, just an example, I put uh, some impression is art that the detail itself is only brush strokes, but when you look at the whole thing, it's pretty, pretty beautiful. Um, you have to be comfortable that some of the products and features that you are building, in, especially in early, early stages, might fail completely. And this is a sort of a different, this is also different when you're in engineering or in product. In engineering, if you are a good engineer, and let's say you need to build certain service that will return certain data from a database, uh, the likelihood that you will gonna build this and then it will not work at all, it's very low. You, you're confident, you know what you're doing. But as product managers, we have sometimes a lot and only assumptions. And it's okay if you have a pro build a product or a feature that will fail completely, um, as long as you can learn from that experience and as long as you can limit, limit your investments into how much you invest to validate an assumption. And um, try not to be attached, attached to it. I, I think that myself as well, when I would build and code and will write a code build solutions, you're really attached and proud of the product that you build because you always try to build the best possible engineering solution. But in product, you're solving problems. You don't build products. So if, if the, the, the product does not solve the solution and it fails, just don't be attached. That's, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, focus on outcomes over outputs. In You will read this in uh, every product management book, but it's actually in reality can be, uh, can be trickier, especially moving from engineering to product, right? As an engineering manager or tech lead, you often try to optimize the output of your team and, and, and you wanna be more efficient, right? Um, if you have agile development process, uh, you solve important problem in the second day of the sprint, you're not just gonna stop working, right? You wanna be able to produce as much as possible. But in product, whether you have a 100% completion rate of your sprint or not, doesn't actually automatically mean that it's successful or it's a failure if you don't have 100%. Uh, what value you and your team provide to the customers is actually, and the stakeholders is what matters the most. I remember in the first years of, of being product manager, I was really bothered when we would not complete all the stories in the sprint. I would be like, we committed to this. Like, why? Why are we not completing it? This is important. But then in retrospect, when I try to think about it, I really cannot find a correlation of success in the product versus completion rate. It's, it's everywhere. So try to focus on the value that you deliver if you don't, if your team doesn't complete everything, it doesn't really matter. That doesn't mean that you know you don't care at all. Um, as a product manager, your audience will be much less forgiving than your typical audience as an engineer. When you're in internal meetings and you talk about some engineering problems or architecture, or you present and you're with your own colleagues, is very uh, people will not put you on the spot. They will not put you in a tough position, but when you're a product manager, it's a very, very different story. You have to be very prepared when presenting to customer. And uh, you should not assume that you will be only able to stick to your part. And uh, you have to be ready to face questions outside of the domain. And you have to remember uh, you are the face of the company and the image that the customer will have for your company can be really influenced by, by what, what you present and how you present things. So this is something that I have learned through not so great uh, experience. Uh, I remember I was pretty new in the company and we were about to meet with a very, very uh, known global brand. So I prepared my part uh, that I was gonna present. Uh, I practiced it. I spoke with the account manager. I, I, I showed her what I'm presenting. I'm ready, I'm gonna nail it. So I go to this meeting. 
and I come in, I start presenting my stuff in just two minutes in the meeting. Uh, the customer says, what about this thing that we talked a year ago? I'm like, oh wow, what is this thing now? So they completely um, found me in surprise. I, uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know how to react. I, uh, I was put in a really tough spot. And I, I think the, they, they started challenging some of the things that I was presenting. They, and, and that was mostly because they were, were not happy that they did not see this thing that uh, they talked about last year. I had no idea about it. And I think that um, the only good thing that I did that meeting was, since I was pretty experienced, I, I, I did not bend on, on, on the pressure. I didn't promise everything, even though a lot of the things they said made sense. But uh, even today, I, I tend not to commit uh, on deadlines in meetings unless I'm ready to do that before, before the meeting. Obviously, we came back, we regrouped, we, we planned, we came back to the customer. They, they were really pleased the second time. They, they would say words such as amazing, this is great. But, I, um, the, the, but the lesson that I learned was when you meet with, with customers, you really, really need to understand all the background. Don't, um, if they're meeting multiple people from your company, see who they're, they're meeting. If you're the only person from product that they will be meeting, what else they might ask you? You have to be competent to, you can obviously answer all the questions, but you have to be prepared to give certain answers that will be satis satisfactory to them. And back to the story, I remember you know, riding my bike home, I was also upset that I was put in that spot. I, I, I thought I, I need to, kind of wanted to blame the account manager, but then I realized how many of you when calling, um, you know, your cell phone company or cable company and someone responds and they transfer you and they ask you to like, oh, can you please, you know, verify your name? What was your problem? You're upset about it. It's like you're one company, even though there are 50,000 people. And it's about a service that you pay 100 bucks per month. Imagine if you pay magnitudes of that. Right, so you have to be really, really prepared. Uh, from time to time, and especially if you are more a technical product manager, you will have some people call this engineering initiatives or tech debt or things that you need to do in the infrastructure for the system to work better. And what you need to under, uh, I, I would I would recommend you to do is to be ready that not everyone speaks the engineering language, and especially the business, the business leader and leaders. And you really need to find their language and try to use some visuals to, to be able to convince them for something. Um, for example, I remember we had in a, on one of our projects we were growing the users, but the uh, solution was not horizontally scalable. Business leaders don't understand necessarily, and they don't need to understand what is horizontally scalable. And uh, the engineers were a little upset because these guys did not understand the importance and they did not want to invest into this, but these other business guys were saying like, why should I invest in something where I quote unquote don't see any value, right? So I, I said to the team, let's try a different approach and I remember walking into the office of one of the managers and I, and I drew something like this. And I said, okay, so I'm gonna to explain to you what's gonna happen. So this is how much users we have now and this is the low time that they uh, experience using our product. If we get to the point of number of users where we wanna be in a year, this is what's gonna happen on the low time. Uh, of the low time, the solution will not work at all with what we are trying to do, regardless of how many users we are adding, not just the load time will, won't change, but it's you know, 10 times faster. Use language uh, companies use like that. Internet companies, mobile companies, you know, when some of them says this is three times faster or five times more reliable, what does that really mean? I, I don't know if someone knows, but it works is something people can relate to. You know, faster is better, more reliable is better. 
All right, so moving from engineering to product manager, um, how can you improve your product management skills? Everybody knows that, right? But there is, you can't emphasize this enough, how important it is to understand your customers' problems and needs. They're a very, very important part of your business. Uh, try to talk with them as much as possible. Get as much as feedback as you can. You can learn a lot by looking into data, but the data itself doesn't, cannot tell you everything, right? So, for example, um, you might look into data and, 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 and see that your product is being used, let's say, on desktop 99% of the time. Does that mean that you should be focusing on the desktop experience or your product is accessed via desktop 99% of the time because your mobile experience suck, right? So data can tell you something, what have happened, but it can't always tell you why, why that happened. So regardless of all the tools that you have, I would highly encourage you to talk with customers and speak as much as possible with them. Um, try to develop empathy and try to, to walk in their shoes. So uh, one of the things you will notice when uh, starting to work with your team being previously an engineer is that, you, uh, that your relationship is usually much, much better than people that have not been technical, right? You understand each other well, you can communicate well, but uh, I don't think that's only because you understand them. I think that, that you understand their language. I think that part of it is that you have empathy. You have been an engineer. You know, you know how it feels. You know what kind of problems are facing. And that, that is helping you build a better relationship with your team. So try to walk in customer's shoes as much as you can. Another important thing is to really, really need to communicate clearly and simply. Every group and department has their own languages and I would encourage you to try to adopt your language according to the audience. Every time you communicate, whether it's a verbal, uh, where you write something or you present, try to put yourself on the receiver side and then try to think about it from the point of view of what do I get out of this? Um, I would encourage you to present and do demos of your products and features whenever you have a chance. Uh, trust me, it takes a lot of time and practice to be able to do uh, all these short and great presentations that, that, that we have seen. Um, in my previous job, uh, we had a new product that was, um, we were building it very quickly. We had a short one week cycles and I decided to record one minute demos and to share them with the stakeholders and the management to report on our progress. And people, I sent a couple of them, people liked them, so I continued doing it. But even though they were one minute videos, trust me, it took me much more than one, one minute to uh, to record them. At the best, it, it would take me five or ten minutes to record them. And uh, you will see if you try to do it yourself, try to record the video of a minute of the feature you want to present. You will start like, hey, I would like to show you. Uh, uh, okay, stop. Record again. Hi. You know, you start. And then you get to a point. As a user, you often struggle with the... Uh, and then stop. Record again. So it takes time and um, takes practice to be able to uh, do short uh, demos. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that, and this is something that I, uh, sometimes is challenging for me still, I'm sure that when I see the recording of this presentation, I will find at least a few places where I could have done a better job than, uh, than what I'm doing now. Uh, and uh, I wanted to also share a, a one uh, interesting quote from Blaise Pascal, a French physicist, philosopher, scientist, uh, in one of his long letters, where at the end he says, I would have written a shorter letter, but I, I did not have the time. 
Uh, you probably have heard this uh, expression, uh, try not to fall between two souls. If you are a tech lead and at the same time product manager, and um, some of us, and I've been in that spot, um, have been put into the situation whether your um, company is introducing product management positions and someone needs to take that role or your, the product manager quits, so you as a tech lead, you try to uh, cover for, for him or her. Uh, try to drop one of those roles because it's, these roles are really complementary and it would be really hard to be successful in both uh, deciding what to build and then deciding how you're gonna build it and what you're gonna commit on and to execute. It's, uh, it might be smooth because you are one person making all the decision, but uh, it's not gonna be the best for the customers. And in, a, in retrospect, when I think about this and my, my situation when I was managing a team and being a product manager, I, I don't think I did the best job for the customer. So if um, some of you might have um, the, the role or title of technical product manager and being known as a technical can, um, can have its own, own, own biases. You will um, likely be by default assigned to more technical products. And that's for, if you think about it, if you're putting your shoes in your manager, uh, not the whole team of product managers will not be technical. And even your manager might not be technical. And very often you have products that require more technical knowledge. So people will feel more comfortable that you are, you are in that role. So you would need to work harder to, uh, to, be, asked, to be given ownership of, of non-technical non non products. In my, in my own experience, I, um, I, I had the role of technical product manager for some time, and I remember I wanted to uh, not, I wanted to, to own products that are not necessarily just technical, and I went to my manager and said, hey, can we you know, just erase this, this technical work from my role? And he said, like, you really care about this? You're gonna do the same job anyways? He's like, I don't care, we can remove it if you want. I said, yeah, let's do it. So we did that and, and suddenly it was so much easier just by that for me to be seen differently and to be given products uh, and more exposure to the customers. And um, you probably from time to time will get on LinkedIn these messages, hey, so and so, there is this interesting role, are you interested to talk about it? Before, when I was technical product manager, maybe eight out of 10 would be for a technical product manager spot. Then it was the other way around. Nothing changed in my experience, uh, in my resume, but just the perception sometimes can make quite a difference. So be, be just be conscious about it. Um, as a product manager, pretty much every department in the company is your stakeholders, so you really need to, to, to build good relationships with them. And, uh, and this is sort of like a, like a domino effect, right? Try to understand how what you do can benefit them and make their jobs easier. So when doing that, this will create willingness of them to collaborate more with you, which will then lead to, for you to be an influencer. And being an influencer can make you more successful in your job. Um, technical conferences are always great, but um, as a product manager, it's also very important for you to attend non-technical uh, or industry-related events. And when on those events, try to network and learn about um, with people as much as possible and try to learn about their perspectives and experience rather than just talking about your your experience. I remember in my first years in education technology, uh, I would attend this South by Southwest EDU. It was uh, maybe the best conference for education. And uh, even though you do your research and everything is available online, I would find so much great stuff there. I would meet so many interesting people. They would really change my perspective. I will always come back with a lot of enthusiasm and ideas. Um, 
as a product manager, you might have a remote team that will not be sitting next to you. And uh, this, is, this is reality these days. I would highly encourage you to, to put an effort to go meet and spend time with, with your team from time to time. Uh, we, um, at my current company at, at Olopic, we have an engineering hub in Cordoba, Argentina. So we, we periodically go there to work and collaborate with the team. I, I think that it's, you know, there is no, the digital tools are getting better and better, but we are human. So I don't think that any digital tool can completely uh, replace the face-to-face. -face. Be a storyteller. Uh, this is very important. So, and why? Stories are easier to remember. And ability to tell good stories can really help your career and your success as product manager. I hope that some of the stories that I shared tonight will stick with you and that will help you deal with situations uh, better than me. Um, and um, there are always online resources, right? So these are, I, I've selected a few that I've used myself. So to get you started, I, I would recommend to read the Lean Startup book. There is a short course from Steve Blank on Udacity about how to build startup. And then there are a few blogs, including the product school blog, that I think it's, 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 it's a good start. And just to close the presentation, uh, the reason that I transitioned into product management was I wanted to be closer to the customer and their needs. I wanted to be to have more say and um, decision-making power to be more involved in the product strategy and to have to be part of the whole life cycle of product development. So, but I, I realized that you don't, you, you sometimes can you end up being in the role. You don't always know that you want to do it, but I would, um, and it's a great opportunity, but I would recommend you like don't stay there if you're not interested or if you have not built some interest. Um, stay there if you, if you want to do it because uh, product management is not better than engineering. No engineering is better than, than product management. They're both, you can have amazing careers and you can be very happy and engage in both of them. Um, try to make the career shift based on your interest. All right, thank you. All right, yes? First of all, thank you for spending the time with us. This was awesome. So as, as a director of product, if you are interviewing candidates, what do you look for in an ideal PM candidate? Uh, I don't think I, I can say there is an ideal candidate. It really depends on the role that you are hiring for. It also depends on the current structure of the team and what kind of a competency you need. Sometimes you need more industry knowledge, sometimes you don't. So it really depends, but when I'm interviewing, what I wanna see is that, that the product managers have a business owner kind of thinking, uh, that they really um, can understand customers' problems, that they know how to prioritize, uh, that, that they're passionate about the work that they're doing, uh, that they have great analytical skills. Um, in the past, I've also looked a lot into how strong technical skills they have, but I've realized that that's not necessarily that, that important. So being a business owner, kind of thinking it's much more important than having great technical skills. Yes? Um, you just mentioned about prioritization. Um, what are good examples of uh, prioritizing? And what are some good examples of prioritizing and some bad examples of uh, same thing in your view? Um, well, bad examples, it's obvious, is um, when people tell you what they want and um, 
this also happens when you, I would say this is, can also be typical when you transition from engineering and product, and now you're suddenly closer to the customer. And they say, this is what I want. You are great, I got this, and then you switch your mindset, you're an engineer, you know how to solve this, great deal. But that's, uh, I think that's a bad example. I think that you should always challenge, regardless of what they say, challenge, try to understand what actually they need and what kind of problems you're solving because what they ask you to do might be very different than what their intent is and why they're asking you to do that. And keep in mind that there is no, there is no formula. I've, I've, I've spoken with many product managers and some of them that I've interviewed say, well, we have this matrix and we assign weight about this, this and that. I, there is no formula. There are a lot of factors in prioritizing. Some of them can be, and first you start with the business value and what kind of problems you solve. Uh, then you look into current commitments and, and how this new, new, new thing fits into your current commitment that you have made. Then uh, you look into how does this thing fit within the strategy of your company. It might be something that uh, even though it's important for certain customers, it not, does not really fit within your strategy or the strategy at the moment. Then uh, other factors even beyond that could be you can build things or new products if, for example, if you want to be focused more on growth, so you're focusing on new products, you don't care, you can just put more people to service them, you don't care about uh, how easy or hard they are to be used. You can also try, for example, your company might be in a period when they say, you know what, now we really want to be profitable. So what we want to do is make sure that we can support a lot more customers with less effort, so in that case, you're looking into um, how much this improves the whole onboarding process, how much this improves the, the ability of the support team to respond to these requests and whatnot. So it really depends, uh, I will summarize again, it's the business value, um, what, how, how does this fit into the strategy of the company and whether your company is focused on growth, whether your company is focused on efficiency. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Can you tell us what were some of the key breakthrough moments in your career? I'm sorry, can you, can you say it again? Key breakthrough moments in your career. Ah, that's a good question. Uh, in which sense a breakthrough? I, uh, I would say, let me think, uh, I would say really the shift of the mindset between uh, outputs and outcomes was one of the, one of the biggest ones. I was puzzled, I was really puzzled how with a very little work or just by talking with a couple of people in the kitchen you can actually deliver a lot more value than just spending hours and hours in building things. I was puzzled, it, it even bothered me to the point like, oh, this is so easy, but it's actually the right focus that helps you. So output, understanding how much more the outputs, I'm sorry, the outcomes are important than the outputs itself. Uh, no, no, we are not. We are not biased uh, towards hiring uh, more technical. In, I mean, product manager with technical experience. Uh, that's understanding how the products are built. It's always an advantage, but we are really looking more for business owners. Uh, in my career, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I thought having a great engineering background, it's a very big 
advantage because I myself am an engineer and I went through that path, but I realized that that doesn't make a huge difference. Maybe if, um, I don't want to say that this is universal, of course, but if, if the role is super, super technical, maybe yes, but for the most of the, most of the roles that I've seen with most of the people I've, I've talked with, it doesn't matter as much. Yes. Uh, so once you transitioned and then being in product, like, do you think you like, change as a person as well? Like, you know, in product, you're just like thinking about so, much, so many more things and maybe you're like talking to more people. Do you think over the years, like what you did at your job, did that, like how did that influence like, I don't know, how you feel or like how you think about certain things? Like, would you say you became like a more well-rounded person or, or do you think that um, I, I, I think that, that, that helped me be more well-rounded person. Uh, one of the things it helped me do is uh, learn how to listen. Um, because you will, you will be speaking with people that have so many different perspectives. And, and, and that's, that's where you get the most value from. So knowing how to listen it's uh it's really really important and that helped me uh, not just professionally but also also privately and i'm very afraid of, like when you made a change you talked about how you were like at a higher level as yeah. an engineer and when you went to the product you started at the more junior level like what were your feelings there like you just ran with it because you were like really interested in product or very very that like you're kind of starting from like scratch or something yeah, so my transition actually was, was very, very quick and sort of coincidental. So I, I would say that when I made a decision to take this job at Thomson Reuters where I would be a technical product manager in the same time um, being an acting engineering manager for all the engineers we had, I, I, don't, I don't think that I really thought this through in too much detail. Everything happened so quickly. I think that from one end, I was comfortable that there was part of that role that I've been doing for years for the engineering manager, so that was fine. The other part was, was interesting. I, I think that after that, when I went from that position to Amplify, I didn't have so much fear, but I had more sort of frustrations because um, I, I soon realized why I had to start from from scratch, because I, it was obviously when when I would speak with more senior product people, I, I did not have those skills. But I've always um, wanted a lot to learn, and I, I I often try to get challenged by some problems, or or every now and then I want to learn something new. So to to me that was pretty motivating. So this whole world that I've been part of in engineering that I, I don't know about, and these guys are great. So it was really motivating for me to, to learn that and to, to catch up. Yes. So, um, have you encountered scenarios where you've had some challenges getting in front of the customers and getting their feedback and have to kind of use in creative ways to do that? Or is that, or is that not really been part of the um, whether I had challenges to get to, to get in front of the customer to like understand the customer well. Yeah, um, I, I've had that. I think that uh, actually we we were we were um, at Amplify. We had a consulting consulting project, and then but for us the problem was that that our key contacts were not actually the customers but it was this consulting company that was channeling uh, requirements through through the consultants and um, we 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 were raising our concerns all the time because we really did not have access to the customers neither the users and we were building a lot of stuff in vacuum uh, we used a lot of the institutional knowledge that we had in the company because we had a lot of educators to try to get as close as possible to the customers. So uh, we had a lot of teachers there, we had a lot of principals, uh, but 
I would say that that was a hack. It wasn't a solution. And uh, at the end, the project was not that successful. And uh, right now, I, I think as product manager, I'm very sort of, um, I, I'm, I try to be not, not, not forceful, but like persistent into getting what I need. And, uh, but I've been lucky to have, uh, to be in a company that really encourages that. All right, other questions? Yes. Um, I think that the challenge is first, I believe in, a, in every healthy organization, both of them are full-time jobs. So you're practically trying to do two full-time jobs. And uh, what I've learned in my experience is you'll be easier, it will be easier for you to do your manager job than to do your job and your colleague's job at the same time. So in terms of, uh, you can be a tech lead successful tech lead if you not, do not commit uh, everything, um, your full time in it. Also, I think that uh, the way those two roles are, are so, sort of, they're built to challenge each other. So it's harder, you know, to challenge yourself and say, oh, this is what I think that we need to build. And then, oh yeah, this is a great idea, let's do it. And then you come up with the solution. Um, that's, that's hard, and I think that the, our space, both in the product space and engineering space, is changing a lot. So to, to keep up with all the, the greatest and latest technologies uh, that are coming out by spending just part time on the job, it's, it's really, really difficult. You know, you can be competent and, and, and providing good solutions for engineering, but in a year or so, uh, unless that's your main focus, um, you, you, cannot, you cannot keep up with that. So I would say drop, if you're in that spot and, and you like product management, try to uh, drop one of the roles. Yes. Yeah, hi, uh, first of all, great presentation. I've come here to talk uh, for Ola, pick uh, some licensing deals, but this was better. <laughs> um, so I'm a 2X, I'm here, uh, you know, tech uh, founder, uh, and we specialize in AI. Now, one thing um, that we have realized, and the last company exited uh, a few months ago, is listening to customers is, of course, there is Paul Graham's advice, you know, talk to your customers with product, talk to your customers with product, and keep on doing it. But what we have seen in a few cases is talking directly to customers, a majority of them might be you, mm -hmm. um, because they try to Though the features might not be good for them in the long term, because when we were pushing for AI, they were pushing for a real customer service executive. And what was happening is that would only increase the cost and to reduce the quality of service. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, apart from talking directly to the customer, like picking up the phone and talking to them, what are some of the other tools that you have that you can use to gather feedback, uh, apart from heat maps and all on your website, to see what would be the best thing to roll out to the customers? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So we use a lot of data. Uh, so you can look into a lot of quantitative data and see uh, that on top of the feedback that you get from the customers. Uh, what you also, and we do this often, is when uh, speaking with customers, you, you, you try to, to try to understand and uh, not just uh, the part of like how they use your own product, but you try to really understand how, how does their work look like? What are the challenges in what you do? So you try to look beyond your product. Um, you also, I think, especially if you want to be one of the more successful ones, you should be looking into some industry trends and, and shifts that are happening. And sometimes you just have a vision. You know, you, wanna, you need to be visionary and you will, I, I would encourage to uh, have a way and have your organization be open to try to experiment different things. Uh, in our company, we do this a lot. We experiment a lot of things and most of them, most of them will not succeed. 
but we always try to learn from them. Some of it is just it's not a good idea, the customers did not respond the way we wanted, some of that is it's just not about the right time, and we will revise this in the future. I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. But as you know, most of the, the for the product managers, the, the fear, um, I, I read one sur run survey and most of the, the main fear of the most of the product manager was that I'm not confident if in what I'm building is the right thing. So that will always, I, I think, remain like that. What tools do you have? Custom tools for development, or do you have some standard, standard tools to collect data? Feedback. So we use, uh, we do, we do in-person interviews uh, with customers. We visit them as much as we can. We look into the standard analytics, like Google Analytics. We also use Chartio to build Chartia, to build reports the, you know, for, for whatever we want. Uh, sometimes we, we, we also use, uh, if you've heard of Full Story, that's an interesting tool that helps you understand. It's, it's, it's more like a recording of how everyone is. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yes. So, <coughs> I'm currently a software engineer, and I'm very interested to become a product manager. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions of things that I can do. I'm trying to make a transition within my company mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons that you mentioned. Um, and I'm wondering if you have suggestions for things that I can do you know, to, to make that happen, to both you know, improve my skills, but also prove to them that they should put me in that kind of role. Like, how, how can I make that transition? Yeah. I would say be, uh, I'm not sure if you have the opportunity currently, but if your company, um, speak with the existing product managers or account managers, I don't know what the structure is, those that are having uh, meetings or research session or conversation with customers, uh, try to listen in, uh, ask them to include you in those meetings. I think that uh, that's, a, that's one, one, one good thing to do. Um, often, in many companies, there will be one-off or temporary or small projects where you don't necessarily have a real team and real product management structure. Try to partner with some product managers and try to see whether you can be a lead on a small pro project. It doesn't have to be big. I would try that. Um, then, you know, speak, get to know them better, speak with them, tell them that you're interested in it. Uh, if you work with the product manager, ask the product manager whether you can, uh, whether they can delegate something to you and um, try to get some more experience about it. Um, ask them for advice. People value, you know, like to be asked for advice. You just, uh, if you have any formal groups for, of product management in your company, try to join that. And that's, that's some of the things that you can do to put you up there. But um, share, you know, share your intentions. Tell your manager, this, I'm, I'm really interested in this. Tell a good story why you're interested and why you think you can do that. Then maybe they will have some creative ideas. How can they um, help you get some skills at the very minimum so they can trust you with, uh, with that role? Yeah. 